you have to have something that lends itself to high scale and high productivity. Cars before Henry Ford were made one at a time by hand. That's not scalable. You're never going to get the cost down to where they need to be. That's one of the reasons that we decided to go the route we did with this simple panel, right? Because it would be something that could be done in a factory, done in a scalable way, and therefore be done at a cost that would make it affordable. Hi, I'm Connor Gaughan, and welcome to Consensus in Conversation, a podcast where I talk with innovators and leaders who are pioneering new ways to sustainably drive profits. Today, I'm joined by Chris Anderson, founder and CEO of Vantum Global, a construction materials company that simplifies the home building process through the use of large structural panels. The components are easily mass produced and can make housing far more affordable for the average family. And because they're fully insulated, Vantum can build the first ever net negative home. Vantum is defying the presumption that a clean or green product must cost more by designing a more energy-efficient home that reduces utility costs for owners, all while emitting less CO2 into the atmosphere. It's a big win-win. Thanks so much for being here today. I I wanted to start from the beginning. You had such uh, a unique and amazing upbringing. So tell us a little bit about yourself and, and growing up. Yeah, well, thank you, Connor. It kind of starts with my parents, who are the rebels. They they joined the Peace Corps. Uh, I think there was the second group of the Peace Corps in the in the early '60s, and and moved to South America, and and actually still live there today. Um, and so I actually grew up in Bolivia. Um, my earliest years in the Amazon rainforest, no no electricity and water for the most part, <laughs> and uh, you know got to see firsthand a lot of the issues that we're, you know, um, battling today in terms of, you know, climate and the impact it has on that part of the world. But uh, uh, that was really formative for me. I'm curious how that's impacted you, your vision, your mission as a business person. How did that experience growing up help define you? You know, at the time I was, it was the early seventies. It, it, it was it was still pretty pristine, at least the part that we were in. But there were people moving in, right? There were people coming in, and 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 people that needed needed a place to live. A lot of these people may have been displaced from other areas of the country, and they'd be coming in and they'd be building houses. And well, what do you do? You cut things down, and you start to cut even more down so you can plant to you know to feed yourself and so forth. So. You know, I saw how at least this little part we were living in, even within, you know, my childhood started to recede. And, you know, I've had the opportunity over the years to go back and it's, it's frightening. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can remember what you saw when you were four or five and six years old. And today it's, it's absolutely gone. The first company that I started was um, a company that was dedicated to doing sustainably harvested wood products, kind of with the thesis that, you know, if we don't give the forest a value, it's going to get cut down. You, you've got to give it a value. So you've got to manage it. You've got to, you know, right. give it um, a reason for people to want to, to manage it and keep it. And, you know, so that was very formative to my early business and kind of did end up um, obviously translating very heavily into the next business, which is, is the business I run today at Vantum. You know, you, you show up in the U.S. for college. What were your career goals at the time? What were you thinking you would do? <laughs> well, I, I studied actually political science, and um, I thought I was going to go into the foreign service and and you know work in embassies and hopefully become an ambassador at some point. And uh, candidly, I didn't pass the service the foreign service exam. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's very yeah, I, hard. You know, it was. I thought. I thought. I. You know. I didn't even. I didn't even contemplate it. That it wouldn't happen. So. Anyway, uh, and, and, and I was well on my way to, um, you know, plan B, which was a PhD and becoming a professor. And, and, and I, I just woke up to the fact, you know, hey, you know, the professors you like are the guys that have, you know, the, the women that have, that have done a lot. They've come to the table with experience, you know. And yeah. so here I was headed to being a professor with no experience and, and decided that's not really what I wanted to do. And, and um, that's when a, a good friend of mine called me, just kind of serendipitous, said, hey, I'm finishing my studies. I've got uh, some ideas on business. Why don't you come up here and let's let's start something? And that's that's kind of what kicked that off. Your first company that you guys founded was was Simex, right? Yeah, yeah. It was more, I, but eventually the, the we changed the name and it was it, Forest World was uh, was the commercial name. Yeah. So how did this idea come about? What you, you're sitting on the patio with your friends says, "Come up here, I've got some ideas." How did you guys land on sustainably harvested timber? 
My friend, he and I, uh, his name's George Sat, and uh, we still work together. He and I grew up in Bolivia together, uh, and we're, we're, we're good friends as kids, too. Um, so, you know, he was aware of the same things and, and I think had the same concerns. Um, and what we saw at the time was that Bolivia was a, a major exporter of raw timber, uh, not sustainably harvested uh, to the U.S. and Europe. And we thought, well, hey, you know, you've got this this situation where timber's being exported without much value added, and there's a, a lot of people that need jobs. Why don't we put a factory in Bolivia to turn that timber into something and export it as a value-added product, therefore giving the forest, um, you know, more more value? That was kind of yeah. the very, the, the thesis. And and I think it was a good thesis. Um, eventually, we noticed that just because you were just giving the forest value didn't necessarily mean you were going to be protecting it. So um, we were one of the very early adopters of a certification system called the Forest Stewardship Council, FSC, uh, which is today a, quite a quite an important organization that has a, a whole methodology of how you should, in fact, also sustainably manage the forest so yeah. that it can regenerate itself as you're um, extracting some resources from it. So that that's that that was the genesis of the idea. And, you know, we built up a pretty interesting business, a uh, couple thousand employees by the time um, we, we, we sold it. Um, and, you know, we were shipping really high quality furniture and construction products, windows, doors, that kind of thing all over the world. This this theme of giving natural assets, the forest, water, some ascribed value, I think, is a, is a theme that I've been hearing a lot uh, about the last uh, year or so. You know, I know the New York Stock Exchange just started packaging natural asset companies, which mm -hmm. is it is a securitization of protection of a natural asset. And it's just it's fascinating that we're bringing along the capital markets in this and kind of trying to actually use. <laughs> the tools we have in the business world in order to uh, ascribe value to and hopefully protect biodiversity globally. So you got the company for a few years and decided ultimately to sell it. What was that journey like? It was not an easy one. So, you know, we, we you know, we, when we started the company, it was early nineties and we, we were one of the first companies, frankly, to, to do what we were doing. And so uh, we, our timing was great. We grew Grew like crazy um, right up until 2000, um, and then and then September 11th hit, <laughs> and um, it sucked the oxygen out of everything, yeah. um, including the banking system. And, and so we were very dependent on the banking system in South America, which was even more vulnerable. So um, it, it just had a huge repercussions on the business, and and and. Um, we almost lost it all right yeah. after that because of just of those difficulties. So it took a number of years to dig back out of, of the aftermath of September 11th. Uh, and by the time that we, you know, we, we got there, um, you know, fortunately the kind of the world had caught up to this idea of sustainably harvested timber. And there were some um, entities very interested in, in, in taking it the next steps. And that's, you know, that's when we decided to exit. And, and out of this comes Phantom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where was that idea from? Give us the origin story. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, we, we were building, as I said before, you know, windows and doors and other construction products. And, and we, you know, we were using really cutting edge computerized equipment and high production, high productivity, high, high precision uh, stuff. So the windows and the doors that we, we'd ship were going all over the world. And, you know, when I go to the job sites, you'd see, oh my gosh, I mean, the, the technology being employed to build the buildings that, that our windows and doors are going into is, you know, 200 years old or, yeah. you know, or older. Um, and, you know, the, this nice, beautiful window that we'd made to a thousandth of an inch in tolerance was going into a hole in the wall that was five inches off. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it just like, oh, well, there, there has to be a better way to do this. And so, you know, that kind of morphed into a, a challenge that, that we set out for ourselves to try to figure out a way to make a home in a much more productive way mm -hmm. you know, by employing a lot of the stuff that we were already doing for the components, right? So automation yeah. and, and production concepts. And really with the objective of doing higher volume to be able to meet this housing need internationally and do it uh, in, an, in a cost-effective way so it could be affordable. And then the third part, which you know, we felt was incredibly important, was to do it in a sustainable way and in particular in a way that wasn't going to add to the already clear problem of CO2 emissions and, mm -hmm. and high energy use, right? So it had to be energy efficient. 
And those were the goals that we set out, and we put together a, a really talented team to, to work on that and, and came up with kind of the basis of the system that, that today is Vantum. So walk us through kind of the how you would explain to, you know, Joe Schmo on the street, the full scope of what Vantum does and can do. Well, what we did was kind of reinvent construction by simplifying it immensely. And so when you look at traditional construction, like overseas, it's brick and mortar, uh, you know, lots of layers, lots of parts, mm -hmm. complexity. You know, when we look at construction in the U.S., it's it's wood framing mostly, right? Also, a lot of parts. You got to cut that wood into parts, and then you put the insulation in the middle, and then all kinds of layers on the inside and the outside. What we do is replace the, the, the complexity of those traditional systems with a much simpler approach. It's a simple structural panel. So um, imagine a four-foot wide brick, essentially, that's, that's 10 feet high, and, and that's what we build with. Um, those panels are structural, so you don't have to put a lot of additional elements on them. And that, that, that brick is 100% insulation in the middle. So it is a very, very thermally efficient block, let's say, right? Yeah. And we then use that block to build the floors, the walls, and the roofs of, of structures. And we do that in a factory. So by the time we're done, the factory is shipping a, a, a modular, complete house that includes everything, right? The electrical, the kitchen, the bathroom. And, and that complete house is a very strong and really thermally efficient product um, that is deployed then to anywhere uh, for single family or multifamily homes. It's so incredible that, that given the complexity that we currently see in American construction, like it's, it could be so simple. It, sometimes it takes people that f are from outside an industry to realize what you just said, right? I mean, because I, I mm -hmm. think that a lot of times innovation really comes from other industries uh, and, and people that aren't enmeshed in that the, the industry that, that they create for, right? So people in construction don't necessarily see what you, 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 what you just said. They don't see the complexity. It's what's being done all the time. Right. Speaking of coming at it from a different angle, I know you not too long ago um, had your Series A round. And I think it's not the traditional Series A candidate. You're <laughs> not a software company. You're not a SaaS company. You're not... Um, necessarily you know looking for a couple of years until you're a unicorn and and yet you had a successful series a round with some great named investors and i'm curious what it was like to go around the circuit the fundraising circuit and say we we make blocks we make inside blocks <laughs> <laughs> well you know we we explained it as technology right <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean it uh it is not your typical kind of uh, sexy technology, but but I think to those that are really interested in energy efficiency and trying to you know attack the issue of affordable housing and energy efficiency, it, it is really sexy. <laughs> so we, yeah. you know, uh, and we're fortunate that that when we created the system and and we sold the other company, I kept back this in, this this IP. We joined forces with a, a really great fund headed by John Preston, who today is still chairman of our board and very involved. And it was patient capital, which is important. When mm -hmm, you're doing mm -hmm. something like what we're doing, it's not it's not an overnight success, like you said. It's something that takes time, especially in construction. It's similar to like pharmaceuticals in a way, because you, you have to test a lot of stuff until you get your, you know, your approvals, just like FDA approval for drugs. We, we need code approvals. That took a long time. That patient capital let us get the company to the point of having all the approvals and, and testing out with millions of feet that we built before going to that Series A. And so when we went mm -hmm. out there, um, you know, we were able to show a body of work that was convincing and, um, you know, proof that the system really works. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're very happy that, that Breakthrough Energy, who, who led that Series A, came on board. And, you know, of course, that's Bill Gates's fund for uh, CO2 reduction and, and, and climate issues. So it was, uh, and they've been just great partners since then. Is there an element of um, CO2 reduction in the mission statement itself of the company? Yes. Um, uh, indirectly, uh, you know, so we, yeah. we, we are very, very focused on energy efficiency as a proxy for CO2. So, you know, our homes, a, a Vantum home is 
up to 70% more energy efficient than what we're doing normally in the United States and over yeah. 90% more ener energy efficient than what is typically done overseas. You know, so the CO2 in the built environment, the majority comes from the use uh, of the building, right? The air conditioning and, and yeah. the energy expended yeah. to operate it. And building is 40%, the built space is 40% of all CO2 emissions. So it's a significant part. It, and, and, what we're doing by reducing 70 to 90 percent of the energy is we're reducing, you know, 70 to 90 percent of the CO2 that is emitted by the buildings that we build. Yeah. As the world talks about net zero, this feels like a big leap in a critical industry. Do you agree? Yeah. And that, I mean, that is our North Star, too. So um, we aspire to build a majority of our of our homes as net zero. And by being so energy efficient, it's a lot more feasible to do it with a phantom product, a lot less expensive. So you, you need a lot less solar panels, right? When you're, you're only yeah. generating a, a fraction of the, the energy need. You know, one of the things we're, we're really proud of is that we're able to deliver a full net zero product because of how energy efficient our homes are at a cost that is basically the same as a non-net zero product made with traditional methods. And that's, that's really, you know, where, where we look to leverage the technology the most in the future. Yeah. It's that green premium that sustainability should cost you more. I'd love for you to comment on this concept. Sure. Well, I mean, the, the green premium is something that we talk about a lot um, as something that shouldn't be there. We worked really, really hard to make sure that with Vantum, there is no green premium. And that's actually, you know, something that we're extremely proud of. Um, I think for a technology to be scalable, a technology to truly be impactful over time, it can't have a premium. It's got to be competitive economically, not only offering that better uh, energy efficiency or, you know, whatever that green aspect is of the product. The flip side of that, too, is I think it, it can't be worse a product at the same price. And that's because I feel like there's yeah. so many that perceive you've got to, you've got to be giving something up and either you're giving up on the economics by paying more or you're giving up on the, the product itself by having a, you know, not as nice of a product service, whatever it may be. I think there's some people trying to challenge that notion. You know, the green premium can come in two ways, right? A higher price, or like you say, a worse product <laughs> and neither yeah. one should be the case. And I think when we look around, you know, the companies that are really scaling and really both offering, you know, a meaningful solution, but doing it on a large scale are the ones where that green premium isn't necessarily there. And the product is is as good or, or in some cases it's better. better. Yeah. Uh, you know, we certainly see that, you know, in the automotive sector now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that 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 that's spilling over now is as as green solutions are beginning to scale across the economy. I'm also recognizing at a more affordable price, probably comes more flexibility for the product itself, right? It, it can be deployed in affordable housing in a, in a scalable way, in ways that perhaps if it were a more expensive product, you couldn't actually use. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. Um, there's kind of a, a feedback loop, right? So uh, if you can be affordable, you're, you can have the economies of scale that allow you to produce and be affordable. <laughs> so, you know, um, right, I think right. the key to that, though, is you have to unlock the first part, which is that you have to be productive. You have to have something that lends itself to high scale and high productivity, right? And so yeah. um, the problem with, say, a traditional traditional building is that it isn't really inherently scalable. It's too complicated. It's, it's, it's the same reason why Henry Ford decided to make cars in a factory and on an assembly line, right? I mean, yep. cars before Henry yep. Ford were made one at a time by hand. That's not scalable. You're never going to get the cost down to where they need to be. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons that we decided to go the route we did with this simple panel, right? Because it would be something that could be done in a factory, done in a scalable way, and therefore be done at a cost that would make it affordable. And I know um, you're now at an inflection point raising a Series B. Mm -hmm. So what does the future look like? What does that scale look like five, ten years from now? Yeah, no, we're so we're really excited about that. We we have spent the, the time since our Series A to today preparing for really a major uh, implementation of, of the Vantum system in the United States and in, and in some, uh, you know, additional countries internationally. 
And what we do is we, we partner with developers, large developers, and we, we go in and do a joint venture with that developer where we build a factory in their backyard, basically, to build with the Vantum system homes that they uh, put into their pipeline, right? And they, and they sell. So we, we, we help the developer lower their costs, increase energy efficiency, have a better product. And of course, they help us by buying the product. What we plan to do from the Series B is um, uh, begin the launch of two factories per year in the United States. And um, we, we already have a number of really strong developers lined up and uh, signing up for these factories. And, and uh, the next five years, we expect to have broken ground on uh, at least 10 factories across the United States. What do you think the 15-year-old you would say right now if they could see what you're doing <laughs> he'd say why why did it take so long <laughs> i mean it it, it is it's yeah. true i mean I, I think that we all when we when we embark you know certainly entrepreneurs that we tend to be kind of um uh, optimists otherwise you'd never you'd never do yeah. what you do you're optimistic about how long things take each one of these companies even though you know, successful by most measures, uh, have taken longer sure. than I anticipated. It always does. So <laughs> I, I'm sure he'd have some suggestions about how to avoid it, but we'll see. <laughs> I suspect that, that he would be quite impressed at the ability that you've you've found and, and the, the path you've navigated to align profit and, and building a business alongside having a, a positive impact in the world. And I'm curious if you could just talk about what that means to you, what that means to Vantum, how you guys see the alignment of purpose and profit. You kind of alluded to it earlier that that it's interesting how we as a society are, are having to figure out how to navigate these challenges within the capitalist system, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, capitalist system is is extremely efficient um, in many regards and and at the same time is short-sighted and ends up creating some of the problems that, that we see. So I think that that doing resolving things within that system it is the right way to go. Now, I think that what works is when um, the system has built-in incentives to lead to those positive outcomes mm-hmm. rather than um, penalties, right? So I think that the, the approach that for example, you know, government took with with the Inflation Reduction Act and offering incentives mm-hmm. rather than penalties really worked. Yeah. Uh, and 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 that's something that we try to ascribe and and, and follow in our business, making sure that the the you know the positive outcomes are aligned in terms of the economic ones as well as the environmental ones in the right way. Yeah, broadly speaking, there are a bunch of different social impacts that I think you could pinpoint through a Vantum success, what all does sustainability mean to you? What's the, the scope, the scale of sustainability? Yeah, so that's something one struggles with, right? Because, um, you know, I guess the ideal of sustainability is uh, an absolute closed loop where where there is zero impact, you know, by the end. That's not very realistic, at least today. So, what we try to do is get as close to that as we can. You know, the life cycle of something shouldn't be drawing more from the environment than it's giving back. You know, that's what net zero is about. And, the you know, the homes that we build, we strive. Um, we're not completely there yet, but we strive to make them completely recyclable. So the bricks, these these panels that we make can, in fact, be recycled back into new panels there's certain elements like wiring and so forth that maybe not totally recyclable yet, but we're working on it. And so, you know, to your point, what's the goal? The goal is to get there uh, so that by yeah. the time, you know, 100 years has gone by, that home that you built it hasn't generated a bunch of waste and it hasn't generated a bunch of additional CO2. Yeah. I know um, in the past you've referenced the ecology of commerce mm-hmm. um, as part of the lens that you approach kind of sustainability in business. And I'm wondering if you could talk to that at all or explain to folks a little bit about that. <laughs> Great book for anyone that hasn't read it. Uh, Paul Hawken um, wrote it quite a while ago. I can't remember. <laughs> now it's probably 20 years or more. Uh, great concept. First time, the, when I read it, it was the first time I had really read something that explained the life cycle impact 
of commerce, yeah. right? So, you know, uh, Paul Hawken makes a great argument that um, the cost of a product isn't only, you know, the labor and, and the materials that went into it, but it, it, we, we, we as a society have to factor in the full cost of that of of, of the lifetime of that product, uh, be it the the you know the waste it creates or the energy it uses, and um, yeah, it's been a, a driving kind of a driving force behind the way we you know I've been thinking about uh, you know the the solutions that we've built. Yeah, I'm really curious what motivates you to keep doing this every single day. So I, listen, we set out to build a company that that achieves those goals, and as an entrepreneur, there's a little bit of ego in it, I got to be honest. You know, you have these ideas. Um, it's natural. You want to prove them out, and that motivates me, proving out the concepts that we've designed. And it's very satisfying to to see a lot of this hard work, go, you know, um, coming to fruition. And, and to have that be contributing to those goals, affordable housing. I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've had the fortunate opportunity to visit families that live in, in houses we've built that frankly, wouldn't have been in any house. They probably would have, you know, been in a, a favela, as they say in South America, right? And then they suddenly are, have these these really um, dignified homes that yeah. they're living in. So that's incredibly satisfying. And to have uh, important institutions like Breakthrough Energy also validate that this this concept that, you know, 10 years ago or more was, was just an, an idea is, is actually worth their time and their investment and their you know their their brand on our company has just been tremendously yeah. satisfying as well. So I imagine the first time you witnessed a family take ownership of a home you built it was pretty special. Do you remember what that felt like? Uh, <laughs> I don't know that I remember the exact first one but I remember one of the early ones and this was this was in Brazil and and the um we we built it's a it was in 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 Minas Gerais which is very hot in the summer and you know they I was there for kind of the ceremony where they handed over some of these homes and um and the, I remember this gentleman that was he, it was it's his home he was you know he's moving into it and um they gave him the keys and he and he and he walked in and he ran back out real quick <laughs> he said it's too cold and there it's too it's too cool because you know our 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 home was so well insulated it wasn't hot you know as, as an oven as he was used to homes being and and he thought there was a bad spirit in there <laughs> so he 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 may he he actually you know was sure that somebody came and blessed the home and all this stuff to make sure there were no bad spirits in it so i mean that that one sticks out in my in my mind <laughs> for good reason that's awesome Globally, we've spoken about some of these big challenges that we face, the changing climate, biodiversity, housing insecurity, supply chain, resiliency in America. And every day, it seems like there's headlines that remind us of all these challenges. For many, it's just really depressing and makes the idea of trying to do something better feel almost insignificant. So I'm curious, how do we push back against that threat and continue to inspire one another to take steps that make the world a better place however we can in whichever little ways we're able? Yeah, I mean, you know, so the pervasive pervasiveness of, you know, negative stories in the media um, is tough. So I think that, you know, um, frankly, podcasts like yours and what you're doing is is really important. The positive has got to be accentuated. And, and I think the problem is that, that negative thinking becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So people that think that they can't impact anything or that you know, the world's uh, going down the tubes inevitably. Well, if you believe that, then that that probably is what's going to happen. But it is possible, I think, to have a meaningful impact. And I think for the most part, if, if you're doing something that's fulfilling to you and you feel is contributing, um, you know, that's part of it. Yeah. That's an important part of it. And you know, I, I think that if you, you think hard enough about how what you're doing affects other people and other species in the in the, in the world, um, you know, you're, you're you're going to contribute positively. I think. Yeah. Well, and hopefully, I mean, the reason we tell stories like yours and is as a invitation to others, a reminder. Hey, there are a lot of people doing it. There are a lot of people that have built businesses or built careers mm -hmm. uh, that are making the world a better place along with making a, a life for, you know, for us. So hopefully we can keep telling these stories and, and finding more folks like you, because I think your story is, is part of that inspiration as far as we're concerned. 
Well, thank you so much. I, I really, really appreciate your interest in, in what we're doing. And, and, and I love what you're doing. Uh, please keep up the good work. If folks want to learn more, uh, what's the best place to go to just follow Vantum and follow what you guys are up to? The easiest place would be go to our website, uh, vantum.com, uh, V-A-N-T-E-M.com. And, and we post, you know, um, um, links to, to everything that's going on, our latest projects. And um, also you'll find on the, on the website how to follow us on, you know, things like Instagram and all that. Awesome. And we'll put, we'll put all that in the show notes so folks can find it too easily. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks to Chris for this conversation. Consensus in Conversation is hosted by me, Connor Gaughan. The episode is produced by Will Gatchel, Chandler Bramstead, and Jeff Rock. Executive produced by me with editing from Reasonable Volume. Special thanks to Consensus Creative Director Kate Tucker and strategist Patrick Gallagher. Don't forget to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We'll see you next week.